Welcome back to another episode of the Coffee and Takes podcast. This is episode number 12, and I'm very happy to introduce a, a very special guest on today's episode, someone that I've only known now for, I think, about a month. Yes, sir. So we live in the same city. I came across Hassan not too far from where my studio is, and we just clicked. And uh, I wanted to bring him down because he's such an inspirational individual. And I've learned a great deal from him in the very short time that I've known him as well. So in today's episode, we're going to be covering a few different topics. Um, but I just wanted Hassan to introduce himself to begin with to the audience. Well, thank you very much, Ali, for having me here. And very grateful for this opportunity. And it's always been a pleasure speaking to you. So my name is Hassan, work in finance. And I'm here because Ali asked me very nicely. <laughs> so I threatened him. I if threatened, you don't yeah. come down. Oh, come on, bro. You, need, you, you can't tell that. That's it. But very happy to be here. And just wanted to showcase my story and how the human mind is the most important thing that you actually need to achieve anything in life. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that, brother. And, uh, you know, as I mentioned, I wanted to bring you down because a few things that you've mentioned to me in the short time that I've known you have inspired me. Uh, your work ethic is tremendous. You know, this is someone that wakes up every morning at 4 a.m., goes to the gym, is committed to turning his life around and has already seen tremendous results. Your story about how you overcame uh, trauma in, in your life at a very early age really hit me as well. And your positive outlook, despite everything that you've gone through, you know, was was just absolutely refreshing. And uh, And I know a lot of people watching this are going to learn a great deal from your experiences and also the wealth of knowledge that you have as well from all the books that you've read. Uh, already he's recommended two books to me that I've bought and I can't wait to just digest. So, you know, I can't think of a, a better person to really bring down to the studio. But, you know, the, the first thing I want to touch on, Hassan, is, you know, your your childhood. You know, uh, what, was it, what, what was it like? And the difficulty that you experienced, which of course you will get into, how has it shaped you into the man that you are today? Wow. First of all, it's an amazing introduction. I need to record <laughs> that. Motivate me every day. Well, in, uh, how do I say it? Childhood was not in this country. So I'm not mm -hmm. originally from here. You just bring the mic a little bit closer. That's it. So uh, childhood, I was growing, uh, grew up in Lahore, Pakistan. Okay. For 13 years, after my dad had been assassinated, I emigrated to the UK mm -hmm. and lived in Birmingham. I know you're a big fan of Birmingham, right? <laughs> Absolutely <laughs> so, you're not, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, lived up there, uh, did my schooling, education, etc., and then moved out to the big wide world that's known as London. Nice. Worked as management consulting, worked in management consulting and strategy consulting and now finance for my sins. Okay. And uh, you mentioned your age as well, right? You're currently 30. Yes, sir. 31. 30 years, 31. 31. Yes, okay. So you moved here at a very young age and uh, I know it's maybe a little bit of an immediate dive into your childhood, but that experience that you went through, you mentioned your father was, yes. uh, was assassinated. I mean, that must have been incredibly difficult for you. How old were you in that? I was 13. You were 13? Yeah. And uh, I, can't, I can't begin to imagine how devastating that was. How, how did you process your emotions when that was taking place? Did you feel that you received the level of support that you needed at the time? To be honest with you, dude, no. Because you got to understand, my dad was a high-ranking police officer slash government official, so he was fairly well known. And that assassin assassination had an immediate effect. Like our world was turned upside down. And due to security threat, etc., I was just literally shipped here. And I stayed with my uncle for a year until my parent, uh, until my mom, and the rest of my family moved here. Now, how difficult was it to process? Extremely difficult. It had significant impact on me in terms of my teenage years. 
do that like, hating my teenage years. I can't remember much of it because I was in such a lost place. Now you got to understand there was a lot of cultural differences as well that had to get familiar with. The command of English wasn't the greatest at that time. And um, just had to understand a different way of life. Because in Pakistan, you had a very privileged lifestyle. You had the maids, you had the servants, etc. You had the house help assisting you. Now you come here. It's, it's different. Now you have to fend for yourself. And I didn't really have that many great role models growing up in terms of male figures. So, but the caveat to that is Ali, I've also been blessed, also have been blessed immensely. God's put great people in my life who I have emulated and modeled. Mm -hmm. So going back to you, a very long winded answer. So how did it affect me? I was depressed for a very, very long time. A lot of negative behaviors. I got diagnosed with ADHD and just emotional eating, just, just, I did not understand what I was going through and neither the people, but I did not understand grieving and really accepting the loss. It took me the best part of, I would say, 15 years, dude. 15 years to live in limbo. And during that time, I had ups and downs in my mental health, etc. But the moral of the story is, man, you got to take one day at a time. But that, back then, I was too dumb to know that. Mm. Hindsight's beautiful. And what, what was the culture like in terms of almost the permission to grieve? Was it acceptable for you to, I know the, in the initial period, of course, everybody's mourning the loss of this individual. Yeah. But then did you feel that you were then left alone to process what was happening? Did you feel like that support could have been better for you? Well, maybe if, if I, how do I say, right? What I know now, if somebody else was to experience that, I would show up differently. Because immediately after I had come here, there was this whole malarkey of, in the Asian culture anyway, I was the eldest boy. So now from a dumb teenager, I was expected to be the man of the house. Mm -hmm. And that put immense pressure on me. Of course. What I didn't realize at that time. And I would just try to be trying to do so much, so quick, failed, didn't really understand what my purpose was. And was the support there? Dude, people, people supported as much as they could or what they understood at that time. Because obviously you came from a, a culture where maybe you're extended family were around you, you could be seen by so many different people and then coming to the UK yeah. and starting fresh. I mean, did you know anyone in the UK when you yeah, moved here? Yeah, well, a lot of our family was here. Okay. But we were in, uh, see, the family here, family support system here is very different. And people are very busy here. Whereas back home, you had an extended family. You had your immediate family, but you also had your neighbors. You had people who you could talk to, etc. But do I look back at it with resentment? No, I don't. Because people did what they could do at that time to the best of their abilities. Mm. And the reality is this, brother. It had to work out that way. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't want it any different because the person I've become, I respect that 13 year old kid a lot more. Everything that's happened in my life, I look back at it from 
different perspective, different lens, different optics. Dude, I have a lot of respect for that kid. Mm. That kid was very lost, extremely lost. But you have to fight through it. Sometimes you have to meet yourself where you are. And you have to forgive yourself. And then you need to move forward. Like I always say, one step at a time. One foot in front of the other. Is that how you process grief? Is one day at a time? 100% man, to this day, I do that. With success, with losses, with failures. And I don't even call failures failures anymore. I call them learnings. Mm. Because you're either winning or you're learning. Absolutely. Now, the difference is, right, what I'm seeing now is if you've, if you've gone through a loss, people feel the need that they need to have the answers immediately okay. and move on. But the reality is this, if you study stoicism, which I know you do, you have to accept it. That acceptance is the biggest, the greatest courage of all. Now, if you see the scale of emotions, acceptance is way higher than some of the most positive emotions that we know. Because acceptance provides you a platform to move on. So without acceptance, you can't move on. Because there will be that negative aspect to your life that you will be chasing down. And it will always turn you into a negative and if you've got negative thoughts, it's going to be a self-fulfilling prophecy. Is that why you think many people prolong their suffering? It's because they haven't accepted what's happened. 100%, man. So they suffer longer than they should. And it's not to say that you'll, you'll ever not grieve the loss of somebody, because I can imagine that there, there may be occasional moments where you remember certain elements of your childhood or a person that you were once very close with. And then in that moment, you'll grieve. But then obviously, life resumes and you have to keep moving forward. But do you think for a lot of people, they're still stuck in that moment and they're not giving themselves the permission to step forward? Brother, you, you've, you've articulated way better than I could. What you've just said, that's the secret sauce. How many people suffer unnecessary? Unnecessarily, they'll suffer. How many people do you know? You get messages every day. I know f so many people that's happened to. It's a choice. Suffering is a choice. Hard stuff is going to happen. Things are going to go awry when you least expect it. Do you think people suffer significantly because they, they feel like they need to find out the reason why this thing happened? So they dig deeper into it. And as they dig deeper into it, they continue to hurt themselves. It's almost like maybe they feel responsible for a certain loss or for a certain event. And so they're trying to find a meaning in the suffering. What do, you, what do you think of that? Dude, that's the greatest gift, isn't it? Finding meaning in the suffering. That's the greatest gift that you could ever have. Find meaning in your suffering. And what does that look like for you? What is finding the meaning in the suffering? Finding meaning in suffering is, first and foremost, you can never find meaning in anything if you don't know what your mission is. You can, you can't, it's impossible for you to understand what the meaning of anything is when you can't relate it to anything. So number one thing is, you need to understand, you will go through life experience a range of emotions but it's on you to get yourself out of that situation no one's coming to serve, save you as much as people want to say we're here for you this that based on you number two what you mentioned about unnecessary suffering look man not many people will have the perspective that you have you're a very wise man i appreciate that not many people will have the perspective I have. You know why? Because society has kind of, it's become a race 
to the bottom who's had the most suffering. But no one talks That's about an interesting the, perspective. Yeah. But no one no one talks about how much somebody has to overcome. Now, I don't look at my my life as any different. Dude, there's two champions in my life. My brother and my sister that passed away. She was four years older than me. She passed away last uh, October. Sorry for your loss, man. Thank you. And she's in a better place. And then I lost my grandma five weeks after. So when I say life is going to happen to you, it will. So why I mention my brother, right? I'm not mentioning him because there's an obvious bias. I'm mentioning to him because he has a rare skin condition. Epidermolysis bullosa, EB. It's a very rare condition. Now that guy has achieved success. Like no one's business. He's a hero in my eye. Why? He's got skin condition. Basically, in, in short, it's called the butterfly, butterfly uh, disease. Okay. So what that is, like we normal, oh, well, quote, as as we're discussing normal human beings, right? Mm -hmm. We have three layers of skin. That dude has two. So every waking moment, he's in pain. But that individual goes to the gym, works out. We work out together sometimes, depending on our diaries. He's looking after his health and achieve success, not in the physical world, but also professional world as well. Now, he's in finance too. Same with my sister who passed away, world-renowned journalist, Myra Ali. Interviewed so many people, Jay Shetty, etc. Dude, these people are heroes. These are the champions. They will, I have never heard these, my sister nor my brother ever complain about the situation. So why would I complain about my situation when I can look at somebody like that individual who's a hero in my eyes and no one can ever take that away. I salute him for what he's overcome. Mm -hmm. And does that make you sometimes look at people who complain about their life who haven't really got anything bad going on does that make you look at them and think well you don't know pain you don't know difficulty a million percent a million percent especially in the west where so many people live very privileged lives and as you said uh, just a couple of minutes ago it's almost like a race to see who's had the most suffering people want to brag about suffering but the majority don't really live a life of difficulty. Their life is good. Dude. They've got, they got a C-class coupe. They live in a, a nice flat in the sea. You know, they've, they've got a, a very good social life, families well, but they're looking for reasons to feel miserable. Do you agree with that? A million percent, man. A million percent. A reason to... You, you, you meant a reason to be miserable. Well, you don't need much to be happy. In this country, and I'm, and I'm a firm believer, UK is the greatest country in the world. You've got free healthcare. You've free education. You won't be homeless here. You will, the government will give you shelter. You'll be on the welfare state. Now it's up to you how you utilise that. That's better than... 98% of the world what they experience. So why on earth would I ever bitch? Am I allowed to say that? Of course. So Unfiltered. why on earth would I bitch about anything? Mm. It, it make it make sense to me. I think a lot of people become very comfortable in the stability of things that they almost look for reasons to fuck their life up just so that they could feel something 
because maybe their life is unfolding in the same way every day and they've got used to the comfort. So in, in certain parts of the world, you know, such as the Gaza Strip, where every day the kids there are screaming in terror, not sure whether they'll ever live to see another day, mothers, you know, being buried underneath rubble, kids frantically running around crying. That life is a life of continued trauma and stress. And thousands of kilometers away in the West, people are waking up, ah, oh, today, you know, it's going to be the same day again. They've got used to the comfort, you know. Comfort is the greatest killer. Comfort is the greatest killer of all. And it's also the fact that they, they no longer see the, the blessing in the very simple things day to day, like ha waking up and having a routine. I mean, that's a privilege. It's a privilege to have a routine. It's a privilege to go to the same coffee shop every day. It's a privilege to go to the same gym and meet your friends. They've ov they overlook those privileges and they, they want to find a reason to feel unsatisfied. Dude, if you want to find a reason to be unsatisfied, you can find a million. You ask somebody, give me a reason to be grateful. These motherfuckers will struggle. And these are the same people that will have a C-class coupe, live in a nice apartment in the city, but they've never had to sit down and process all the good things. Because I remember when I first got into journaling, gratitude yeah. journaling, I'll be honest, even I struggled initially to think of good things. And it's probably because I was living a life of comfort for a period of time. And I was comparing myself to those who had more, quote unquote, when I say had more, it's materialistic. I was looking at superficial stuff and I forgot that there are billions of people that have far less than me, that don't even have central heating, that don't have a, a consistent water supply, electricity. You know, I, I lost track of that because I was living in, in a society where things are comfortable. Of course. Everything is nearby. I've got everything I need. So I, I lost touch with reality. And even I struggled to write down things I was grateful for. And then eventually after practicing gratitude journaling for a while, I realized, man, even the basics, your health. So many people are bedridden. They can't get out of bed every morning. They, they wish they could go for a walk. Dude. Just a walk. See, remember when we first spoke and you said, why on earth would you go gym at that time? And what did I say? Brother, I get to do this. Mm. I get to do this. There will come a time. So for the audience, Hassan goes to the gym every morning at what time? 4.45, brother. I'm in. 4.45. So he wakes working. up at like 4 o'clock. He's in the gym. I was lazy today. I was lazy today because Sunday. 4.15. 4.50? I had a line. Guilty. <laughs> Just an extra few minutes. Yeah. Even the champ needs it, right? <laughs> But, you know, I asked him, I said, you know, what, how, how are you able to do that so consistently? You know, because we speak on a regular basis and I see him always in the gym, always in the gym. You know, so. On top of my normal routine that I have to do. Yeah. Right? Which is which is incredible. And so to, to carry on your point, you were saying I get to I get Dude, to go to the I gym at this time. This. I get to have this conversation. I get another day on this earth. I get to do this. I get to enjoy my family. I get to have great friends like yourself, great brothers like yourself. So one thing I've realized when I was journaling, right? I wanted, I wanted to write this down. Mm -hmm. And if you don't mind, I'll, I'm going to read it out because I don't want to butcher my own findings. Absolutely. Feel free. Share it. So... So this is this is the video I made, right? Maybe the journey isn't so much about becoming anything. Maybe it's about maybe it's about unbecoming everything that isn't you. So you can be who you're meant to be in the first place. Mm. Unbecoming. Unbecoming, sir. That's powerful. So when you mention we get comfortable, we start moaning, we start bitching, we start... Dude, you can go in Tesco's and buy food. 
you could have all the nice stuff that you want. You, you get, get to choose what fruit you want. No one's handing you anything. You get to choose. Ask people who haven't... Ask somebody who hasn't got a parent. What would they do to bring the sibling or parent back? What would they do? They'd do anything. I know I would. I know I would. It's the journey of unbecoming ABH. By the way, if you don't know, guys, Ali, I call him ABH out of love. Absolutely. That's my nickname, ABH, yeah. Ali Ben Harris. That's it, sir. That's it. And ABH, like how many times we have taken this burden on of our past discretions or indiscretions? If you haven't been the greatest previously, and then you're carrying that 300 pound gorilla on your back because you failed at something. Or it didn't go right. It didn't give you the result that you wanted. Now you're carrying that, that shame, that judgment, shame, judgment, people, what are people gonna say? What does that do? It prevents you from taking action in the next venture, your next chapter of life. Maybe you need to just stop. Maybe you just need to stop and accept. Cool. The person that I was then is not the person I am now. You've evolved. You've evolved. By, by simply accepting. By simply accepting that you made mistakes. Technically, you're not that same person again. Mm -hmm. You may physically look the same. Yeah. You may have the same life. But you aren't the same person. And now you've mm -hmm. got to make that differentiation and you've got to be cognizant of the fact that you're not the same person and you're going to, be, you're going to have different actions in, to enable you to become the next best version of yourself. Yeah. So some, at some point, we have to meet ourselves where we are and to look that man in the mirror and say, hey, I fucked up. Do you think it's a lesson of forgiveness as well? It's looking at your past self and forgiving yourself for the actions that you took. I mean, I always say when I coach fellas who feel remorse about a certain way that they behaved in the past, I always tell them you acted in the way that you thought was best fit at the time. Of course. You didn't know any better. You know, your first breakup is usually a very devastating experience as a guy because love is this new thing Check. for you. Yeah, you know, you've had it, I've had it, right? It's a very confusing period of time because you weren't given a boot camp on how to be a good lover, how to be a good man for your lady. And so you go through this chaotic experience and then you do something maybe that you shouldn't have done, like get, get on your knees and start crying or send a voice note of you crying. And I've heard all, all kinds of stories. And a lot of these guys look back and they're like, oh, why did I do that? That's a terrible thing to do. But then I tell them, listen, man, you... You were grieving the loss of this person at the time. And you did the best thing that you thought was appropriate at the time. Maybe it was running back after her and saying, I'm so sorry, or writing a letter or crying in front of her, whatever. And yeah, now in hindsight, looking back, if you could change things, you would. But you can't go back in time and change things. So forgive yourself. Forgiveness is an important thing. Dude, judgment and forgiveness. I wish I could tell people this. You have to forgive yourself. And don't judge people. Don't judge yourself. These two things, if you could master, life becomes a lot easier. Ask me why. Why is that? Forgiveness. You've got to understand, I'm a believer, I'm a Muslim. So, God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He's the most forgiving. If he can forgive you for your indiscretions, why can't you extend the same grace to yourself? And by, by the virtue of forgiving yourself, you become a more mature, a nicer version of yourself. 
and you'll extend that grace to somebody else as well. Mm. Number two, judgment. Dude, I see so many people go through life judging others. You're not God. Stop judging people. It's like the other day I had to tell one of, one of my friends, he's like, I'm not going to give money to the homeless dude. Why? Obviously he's going to spend it on drugs. I said, okay. I said, but you've just made the judgment call. Why, why are you playing God? Why are you playing God? Are you God? I say, if God's blessed you and you want to bless somebody, why are you putting uh, judgment on that? That's up to him. Once you've done your part, whether he goes, bites, crack, whatever he wants to do, that's up to him. Or he buys a meal deal, what a, whatever. That's not on you. But God put that in your heart to bless him. So bless him. Because once you bless somebody, you best believe that's coming around. It's an abundant mindset to bless another person, isn't it? Because you're sharing yes, sir. a blessing that was bestowed upon you by God. It's a, it's a very, it, it's, it reflects a person with an abundance mindset. For me to give, I have confidence that more will come. Someone that doesn't like to give is usually someone that has a scarcity mindset. Or, like you said, a judgmental mindset. And one thing about judgment is people like to give judgment but don't want to be judged. <laughs> yeah. 100%, man. Because people are judging us every single day, whether we like it or not. Someone might look at me, and I've had someone say this to me before, actually, uh, who's currently a subscriber of mine. He said, when I first came across your videos, I thought you were an obnoxious prick who was so full of himself. But then I actually removed my judgment, or I, I moved it to the side, and I thought I'd give you a chance by watching some of your videos. And I, I ended up liking your character. I think, you know what, this guy's actually a pretty decent guy. I judged him without hearing him or understanding him. But dude, that's, if we just adopted that mentality, 95% of the problems that we face globally would finish. With the same, like, dude, judgment. You start judging people. What was my judgment of you at first? You came out, you looking swell. What did I say to you? I said, brother, you're looking good. And I wish you have a lovely day. Did I, did not say that to you? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I said, fuck, dude, I want, I want, I want that. I want to be like you when I grow up. <laughs> and you started laughing. And this yeah, is yeah. how we beca became friends. Mm -hmm. But if I wasn't there to celebrate your success, how, like, dude, we're all doing well in our lives, but it doesn't take anything away from me to let you, to give you your flowers, brother. Mm. Hey, bro, thank you for inspiring me, man. That's something I really respect about you. It's, it's your abundance mindset, your willingness to celebrate other people. And I've, I've seen this in the short time that I've known you. I've seen you interact with other people and just your aura, the way you carry yourself and the way you recognize people's strengths. That's why people gravitate towards you. I've noticed that. And this is something that I don't Fuck see very me, man. often. I thought it was my good looks. <laughs> and your incredibly <laughs> handsome looks, of course, right? But, you know, that, the, the way you carry yourself, it's, it's, it's no surprise that people gravitate towards you. Because when I'm around you, I could feel your energy you know, your positive energy. And I think a lot of people often forget that when you interact with somebody, when you leave that interaction, how do they feel? Do they feel like, you know what, I've had a very good conversation. I feel positive after being around you. I feel uplifted. Maybe you said something nice to somebody who hasn't received a compliment in months or years. And that very interaction is the little boost of morale that they needed. Dude. You gotta understand, somebody somewhere out there, people are going through stuff. And there's an uncle of mine, I learned this lesson, I was blessed enough to learn this lesson, I've just always had it in the back of my mind. Uncle Zahi the mine, right? Dude's an absolute stud, by the way. And he said, he said, 
You know, if you ever want to be successful in life, you have to, the, not the money. He said, don't worry about the money. He says, true success in life is when somebody leaves your presence, they say, you know what? There's something about, like, I really enjoyed that interaction. I really enjoyed that. He goes, that's when you know you, you become successful in life. When somebody leaves your presence and they feel, you know what? I've just been re-energized. Mm -hmm. I'm with that. That was probably the most profound lesson I've ever learned. Uncle Zayed, if you're watching, man, you changed my life. That's amazing. I think people underestimate how it helps them when they help other people, when they share a word of positivity to another person. Because people think, why should I say something nice? You know, most people don't care, whatever. But when you, when you treat others well, it makes you feel better about yourself. It changes the way you feel about you as well. When you help someone who's less fortunate, when you help someone who's going through a tough time, they feel energized, but also when you walk away, you feel energized in a certain way. Dude, you could only treat somebody well if you treat yourself well. You can't, you can't give something that you don't have. So this is why when I can, I can judge people so easily, right? I know we talk about judgments and stuff. You can really read the room or read the cold read people really well. You can really tell people, <coughs> sorry about that. For example, if how they interact with certain people and the nuance in their sentences, what they'll say, backhanded compliments, is because that person is suffering from great insecurity inside. You can some, say that again. Yeah. So if, if they're doing that, you just got to put them aside and say, what's up, brother? Talk to me. Why are you doing that? And you'll be surprised what they come out with. It will never take anything away from you. So you know when you, they say some of the richest people are some, some of the most kindest people? Dude, because they understand the fucking game. They understand the fucking game here. The game is to ultimately make people better. That's the game. What you said right there was so powerful, especially about people that, you know, extend backhanded compliments or say a derogatory word. They're usually hurting themselves. And there's a quote that goes along the lines of hurt people, hurt people. Hurt people. Facts. You know, there's an underlying pain that they've been holding on to. And so they resort to negativity, but they're really mad at themselves. They're not mad at the person they're that they're being negative to. And this is why I never take online hate seriously, because for someone to really hate you, I mean, hate is a strong word. Strangers online can't, can't hate you. I mean, they may hurl insults at you, but it's usually because they're mad at themselves. And maybe there's something about you that triggers a certain event in their mind. Maybe they promised that they would start taking the gym seriously. And then they're seeing you in the gym at 4 a.m. And they're like, just fine. let me call him a little steroid user or a little wannabe or whatever, or an Arnold wannabe, whatever. Let me say something that... From the mom's basement, by the way. From their mom's basement, yeah. <laughs> and it's usually accounts with no profile picture. No profile. Listen, man, you know, the funny thing is, guys, if, you, if you're that type of person hating on ABH, like, <laughs> I, I, I see these motherfuckers coming a mile away, bro. It's like, dude looks like an absolute stud. So... <laughs> Quite frankly, you're fucking I'd hate losing. me too. No, yeah, no, no. no. I, bro. <laughs> like, let, let's keep it real. Let's mm. keep it. Let's keep it a buck fifty now, right? So you dress smart. You're helping people. You're a public figure. Like when we've gone out for dinner. I was like, fuck, are you that? Are you? And that's, I didn't know you that well, by the way. And remember, and I said, like, who the fuck are you? Mm. And... So we were just coming out of London and in the restaurant, three people stopped you. Hey, bro, you changed my life. 
thank you. And I still remember this interaction. And I was like, is this guy fucking Batman that I don't know of? <laughs> and it was like, this person, God's on through it, right? This person comes up to Ali and says, you changed my life. And what was your response? Brother, you changed your life. And I was like, that's a winner there. I don't want to take credit for the work that someone did themselves. I may have sparked something in a person, but they went out there, they put in the work, and they have to give themselves the credit for doing that. No, fuck that. I'm going to give you credit for something. <laughs> when we were talking, we were having these normal conversations, right? And what did you say? Why didn't you jump online? And I was like, mm. no, brother, I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that. Yeah, because I, I told him to jump on content creation. And I was like, dude. And you told I, me that it's something that you've I've, flirted I've, with. I've before. flirted with. But then I was like, nah, this isn't me. Like, I'm fairly private, dude. Like, I, I, I'm an introvert at heart. I look extroverted, but like, I come across as an extrovert, but I'm, I'm a really an introvert. You know me better than most people. Mm. And what did you say to me? Gotta force yourself, gotta go out there. And. It, I said, give me till, give me one day. Give me one day to come back to you. And what did you say? Cool. And then when I came back with the answer, I said, I'm in. And I said, with, I said it with conviction. I said, I'm in. I said, but the only thing I want from you is to help me understand these different platforms. And you embraced it. You threw yourself right in the deep end and you continued to embrace it. I speak to a lot of guys that want to get into the world of content creation and everybody wants to reap the rewards of doing it, but not the input required to reap the rewards. However, Hassan, he's embraced it with both hands. And Big hands, the reason the why <laughs> his tremendous hands. Pause. <laughs> And the reason why I see you doing very, very well as a content creator is because of your reason behind doing it. In fact, share it with the audience. What is the reason why you wanted to begin creating content? And that was one of the questions he asked me. He goes, why, why did you want... Dude, the followers, this, that, I couldn't care. I, I was asking you only a couple of days ago, how do I put music on? Remember? Mm. That's how dumb I am, by the way. So, the reality is this, guys. And I said this to Ali. I said, very simply, I said, there's someone out there who's, who's going through a tough time. And I just want to be that source of inspiration. That if I can do it, you can do it. No mountain is high enough. But if you're at the bottom, you're looking at the top, it looks daunting. But you have to take that step. That one step, one foot in front of the other, man, because everyone's capable of doing it, no matter what it is. And to make life easier. If you went to dinner last night and you skipped the pudding because you were trying to lose weight, you're a fucking hero. Celebrate yourself. Because you did better than what you would have previously done. So you won. Now my job is to be that coach slash uncle that you never had. And build a family of winners. Because whether you like it or not guys. You guys. There's somebody out there looking at you as a leader. As a hero. You mean something to them. And how do you show up for them? Don't be that piece of shit who's being selfish and doing it for yourself. So when previously I toyed with the idea, it was about me. Oh, I wanted to be creating content, but I was doing it for selfish reasons, for my own vanity. But now, fuck me, it's not about me. It's about the little Hassan that I could help. The youngsters I want to help. 
the great women that we want to help, the great men that we want to help, says our generation, and we, we've talked extensively on this, brother, it's the most lost generation I've seen. So now it's our moral duty to be ripped, rich, and to be great human citizens and great human beings. And there's nothing wrong with anything of that said. You mm -hmm. have to be the best version of yourself, whatever that may be. You may not be as fancy as Ali, getting tailored suits, <laughs> looking like Pablo. <laughs> like, whatever your version is, guys, you need to go pursue that. Because if you're not, that will eat inside you. And you will be in a perpetual loop of unhappiness. Exactly, exactly. Ignoring your purpose causes distress, confusion, anxiety. And I was speaking to someone about this recently. You know, men... Men are individuals that need to hunt in order to derive fulfillment from life. We need to hunt. Even lions, if you look in the animal world... If an animal's dead, it doesn't eat it in most cases. It just walks past it. What, what do they live for? The chase. Running after the buffalo. Digging the claws into the back of the buffalo. Taking it down. Taking grabbing the throat. The throat crushing it. the windpipe. It's the process that makes the animal truly alive. And it's the same thing for us men. We need something to sink our teeth into every day. Otherwise... We are a watered-down version of ourselves. You know, even the book, The Way the Superior Man, which I have behind me, it talks Great about book, it. Great book, by the way. Fantastic book. Great book, by the way. I mean, so many people still haven't bought this book. I don't know what they're doing. But even in that book, it talks about the importance of finding your purpose as a man. It even says that your purpose comes before your relationship. And unfortunately, a lot of guys have prioritized the relationship ahead of their purpose. And as a result, their woman doesn't get their most authentic version, right? And they live a life of stress. Dude, that isn't, that's about 15 episodes there, what you've just said. So many guys want to chase, chase, chase the relationship. Not the purpose, the relationship. Let me tell you this, guys. If you are not concentrating on your purpose, you could kiss goodbye that relationship because it's a ticking time bomb. How many times have you seen that, brother? Oh, I've seen that happen numerous times. And I don't blame the women either. I mean, if you're a man who has nothing going on in his life and you're not trying. See, if you're someone who's gone through a turbulent period, but you still have something that you're pursuing, different conversation. But if you're someone who's just laying on the couch eating unhealthy foods every day. Wake the fuck up, right? <laughs> Wake the fuck, this is shit. If you know, you know, right? Shout out to Eddie. <laughs> but if you're someone who's laying on the couch, eating a bunch of shit, watching things you shouldn't be watching, are busting about, gallons uh, all over yourself, right? Are we, are we talking about the Kleenex and the P, P word? <sighs> Absolutely, we oh, are. Look, fuck. I'm unfiltered on here. Yeah. If you're a dude that's busting nuts all over himself and you're eating shit, you're, you're going to feel very anxious. The special socks time. Sock time. The, the socks, whatever you want to <laughs> use, right? I mean, we've all been there. But if you're, if you're a dude who is engaging in these negative habits and you have nothing that you're pursuing, it's absolutely a ticking time bomb. Dude, I can't tell you how many times I've seen this happen in my life. It's ridiculous. You have to be the best version of yourself. At all times as at, well. At, it never stops. Dude. Ali, and I've heard you say many times, the perform burden of performance is always on the man. Women and men love differently. Women and children are loved unconditionally. But for men... Fuck us. I'll be loved unconditionally. Listen, a woman can only love her children unconditionally. 
even your ass ain't getting loved unconditionally. Facts. And I would love to argue anyone who says that. Otherwise. Mm. Absolutely. And going back to what we said earlier about acceptance, it shouldn't be something that you're upset about. It's just the way things are. It's just the way things are. Come to terms with it and embrace the burden of performance. Don't view it in a negative way. It's an absolute honor to lead your family as a man to the promised lands, to take care of your wife and children, to navigate periods of uncertainty. Your wife will look up to you. Wow, we started off here. Now he took us to this level. What a man. But so many guys are like, oh, she's not supportive of me. And, you know, mate, you've been unemployed for eight months. You haven't even been going to any interviews. You've let your body deteriorate. And don't give me the, well, I can't afford a gym. And run. Fucking walk. Walk even. Oh, for fuck's sakes. You know, I love the people who complain. Right? I would love the gym. Gym is a fucking privilege, by the way. It's an absolute privilege. But if you can't do that, dude, walk. If you can't walk, just get crawl, on. for goodness sakes. If you can't Fuck's even walk, sakes, crawl. that burns more calories than anything. Mm. Precepts. But you know, Ali, you can give, if somebody does not want to change, you can give them the whole blueprint. How many people, how many people you know or wanted your help have really delivered? The majority haven't. You know, the majority of people are what we call ask holes. They ask a lot of questions, but they never implement the advice you give them. And people are more than welcome to take advice or not take it. But it's usually those who are struggling and keep coming back and asking the same question when you've told them numerous times, this is what you should do. These are people that enjoy the sound of their own voice when they complain. That they feel good complaining. First and foremost, if you didn't understand that, you should not be watching the show. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, for a lot of people, it goes in one ear out the other. You know, I look, I used to be that guy in my late teens, early 20s, where I'd ask the same question. And then it's just many years later, it dawned on me. That's a sign of absolute incompetence. To ask the same question a thousand times. With different variables. You're trying to find a different way of saying it and not implementing, most importantly, the advice that this person who's ahead of you is telling you to implement. I mean, there are broke people that think they know more about business than business people who make a lot of money. Yeah. And it's just baffling. There are people... I mean, I can't wrap my head around it myself. You know They're what? behind on their promises, behind on their payments. And yet... Their ego is up here, but it's not a warranted ego. It's not an earned ego. It's an inflated artificial ego. These motherfuckers. Delusion. What are they called? The Monday morning quarterbacks. <laughs> I've never heard of that saying before. The Monday morning quarterbacks. Yes, sir. These guys will give you the whole spiel. It could have been this way, that way. Have you ever got on the pitch? Have you ever even got yourself in the race? Have you ever laced up? No. Okay. So let's not speak about it. Oh, so you wouldn't dress up like Ali? Oh, why? Because it's too pompous? Okay. So you're speaking on something that's not even an option for you. How dumb do you sound? Is that me saying... I wouldn't want a six-pack. Why? Why would you want a six-pack? Motherfucker, you ain't got the discipline to get that six-pack. Facts. Facts. So, how about you shut the fuck up and get to work? Oh, well, I wouldn't want to be rich because rich people are miserable. <laughs> <laughs> oh, bro. You, you know, know why this made I'd me I'd rather just stay where I am and, and live a very simple life because the rich are just miserable. Oh, fuck me, man. That, that propaganda in itself that's gets a, me fired That's propaganda. Up. That's what it is. It's, it's designed in such a way to ensure that as much of the population as possible doesn't try 
to become better, that they stay average. When we go out for dinner and we've got a couple of friends with us, is anyone looking to split? Or we, well, somebody just goes discreetly, pays, picks up the tab. Exactly, that's what we do. There's no, oh, you pay fifteen forty five. I'll pay. I don't like that myself. That's scarcity thinking. Like, come on, brother. It's like you're playing. You want to play with the big boys, but you ain't got the appetite to take the L's like the big boys. I want to touch on this actually because this is a, a topic that's not really spoken about very often. It's removing the residue of poverty thinking off of your body. Because, look, some of us, we've grown up in households where the conversation of money wasn't a constructive one. Which you know, is probably the most important thing you need to ever have. We, exactly. But that conversation isn't had in a healthy way with a lot of youngsters. You know, I grew up in a family where saving was like the big thing. Save your money. Don't take risks. And... In a way, I don't blame my parents. My dad was an immigrant to the UK, left everyone behind to start this new life. He was in his mid-30s when he moved here with children. So for him, the, the immediate priority isn't to go out there and launch an entrepreneurial endeavor. He doesn't even know English properly, right? So He's done well, though. He's done well for himself. He's done incredibly well. And I well. give him absolute credit. And in fact, I can't thank him enough. And I, I want to be able to repay him in ways which... Well, we'll never be able but, to But we'll do never that. be able to with our we'll parents. We'll never be able to do that. We'll never be able to, you know, but we can strive as much as we can to be the best versions of ourselves as a thank you to them. That's how you thank your parents, by becoming the best version of you. That's what my parents always tell me. They always tell me, Ali, my dad tells me this. He says, if you're a better man than me, I'll know I've done a good job. But I tell, you know, I always reply to him and say, Dad, I'm going to bloody try, but you've set the bar so high. If I can even come within 10% of being the man that you are, you know, but that's, that's the dream every father has for his own son is that my son goes out there and magnifies everything I've given him and becomes a better man than I was. You know what I mean? That's the only man that wants you to be better than, than himself is your own father. Dude, that's powerful. But everybody else, the moment you start getting a little bit too successful... The enemy's attack. But your father will be the only one in your corner shouting at you saying, hey, you can be better. You know what I mean? So, you know, touching on what I was going to mention about the residue of poverty, this thinking, and thank you for bringing this up because I've been wanting to speak about this for a while. This thinking of, oh, you know, I want to become this big, successful dude with a massive business and Lambos and stuff, but I can't seem to... When I go out for dinner with my boys, I don't want to pay the entire bill. And look, we're talking reasonably here. We're not talking about going to Sexy mm -hmm. Fish or whatever yeah. and paying for 10 people. No. Guilty. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> You've been there. Yeah? That caused bankruptcy, <laughs> right? But, you know, t to a degree, you have to start acting as the person you want to become. And you are someone who's very qualified on the whole subject of law of assumption. You know, oh, you've, you've read quite a lot about Neville Goddard and... Yes, sir. The power of the law of assumption. Touch on that, because you brought it up. I'd like to get your perspective on acting as the person you ultimately want to become. How important is it to pay the bill for your two mates when you're out in a reasonable setting? What does that do to you when you do that? It just affirms who you want to be. But if Say that again. Bitching, it affirms who you want to be. If you're bitching about a £15 coffee between the three of you, Boy, oh boy, you've got some hurt coming your fucking way. First and foremost, if you're in that situation, motherfucker, you don't need a coffee. You need to get to work. You need to, you need to learn some skills. You need to develop a different mindset, a, a healthier lifestyle, a healthy mindset towards finances. You need to learn the skills to pay the motherfucking bills. Like, it's simple, right? It's that simple. I can't mm. articulate it any better. And most importantly, it's, it's, a, it's a scarcity way of thinking. That's the biggest issue. So these individuals need to develop an abundance mindset. Because what is money? Money is a bunch of numbers on a screen. A ABH, and we, t we spoke about this, right? It's a way you transact value. That's all money is. Now... Slightly going, taking a bit of a U-turn here. Going back to the original point. 
of becoming the best version of who you think. That's where, that's where fake it till you make it comes, by the way. So people have got it twisted. I need to rent a Lambo, this, that, to, in order for me to feel successful. No, 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 no. You have the best version of yourself, and then you put the work in in order to become that best version. And somewhere in the middle, you'll meet. But it's not getting a rented, Ram uh, rented Lambo, staying in the penthouse, putting in the fucking gram. That's not faking until you make it. That's, that's, that's the quickest way to be unhappy because you know you have just fucked up your money on a situation you know that was so short-lived. However, if you decided, okay, cool, I view myself being at this level, what does that person have? What skills does he have? What's his outlook like? And then you start emulating those behaviors on a daily basis, one day at a time. And That's then, what it is, yeah. Then two years will go by, a year will go by, three years will go by. You become that person. And then your vision needs to change again. And why does it need to change again? Oh, dude. Because the success is not a destination. It's rented. Success and winning is rented. You need to put the fucking work in every day. You need to put out every single day. The way I look at it, life is, brother, I just want to win the day. I'm not even thinking about the future. Nor am I thinking about the past. I want to be present with you. I want to be here. That's it. I'm not catastrophizing what's going to happen in the future. I'm not shitting on myself and picking up that 500 pound gorilla or what 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 could have been uh, if i didn't do that mistake so fuck that dude all you have is today that's all you need this is where people i see so many people fail they forget what life is life is a mathematical equation it's physics. That's all it is. Now, I'm not the brightest person, but I'm intelligent enough. I've got a couple of brain cells. <laughs> I'm intelligent enough to realize, dude, it's the work you put in today, they will accumulate. And then three months down the line, six months down the line, a year down the line, you're going to reap the rewards. And it's that patience element that a lot of people are not comfortable with the idea that it could take two three four years we live in a very short-term microwave society that demands immediate results but that's naive thinking it's naive isn't it dude it takes longer than you have longer than you expect it's more expensive than you expect exactly but i mean if you look at construction projects they usually overspend and they usually take longer, especially here in the UK, right, to complete than initially planned. And that's, that's a very good analogy, actually. I like, I like how you, bought, you, uh, you mentioned that. It's input and outputs. You stack enough wins, your life is going to look like a winning life. And if you fucked off 50% of the time, 50% is what grade? Is about D or something? Then why are you shocked if you've got a D standard life? That when you're going to Asda, Tesco's, where the fuck you shop, you're struggling. You're thinking, oh, fuck, dude. Like, I hope, I hope I've got enough money. But if you've got an A star life, you've been consistently winning. You're getting the 95s. You're 98%. Dude, you walk in any shop, you don't have to worry about the funds. So someone who's been losing for so long. You mentioned winning the day. Just start off by winning the day. How can someone win the day? Dude, this is a concept I learned from Andy Frisella. Shout out to Andy Frisella, by the way. If you don't follow him, follow him. He's been transformational in my life and my journey. And I'm blessed to have him in my life. He's got a concept, win the day. That, that concept is fairly simple. 
All you have today is today, right? And all you got to do is win. So whatever the objectives are for today that you want to achieve, you just go tick. Boom. Systemize your day. So what does that do? When you're constantly winning, winning, winning. Now you're getting that belief. Oh, I can actually do this. Your habit's stacking now. Your self-esteem is going up because you're keeping the promises that you actually said you're going to keep. You're doing the work. But if you're there saying, oh, fuck you off, I'll do it some other time. What do you think that's going to do to your confidence? So why are you then surprised that life, when life throws challenges at you or you want to go achieve that big goal of yours, that you find yourself in the classic analysis paralysis stage? Because you haven't built, you haven't validated yourself with your daily habits. You haven't showed yourself that you respect your word. So how the fuck are you going to go out there and achieve anything? And I, I, that's so true. And that's why I think a lot of people don't trust themselves. It's because they've said in the past that I will and they don't. And then that, when it's accumulated, when you've told yourself you'd do something 10 times and you haven't done it, you almost don't even want to bother trying because you don't trust yourself one bit to get the job done. Dude, when you said to me, you just need to make videos, did you coach me on any of them? Did you tell me what angles to do it? Lightings? What's, what, what bloody, whatever they're called, what apps to use this? Uh, you just said, do your best and we'll figure the rest out. You'll figure the rest out. Especially in the beginning. People overcomplicate the, uh, overcomplicate the beginning. They want to start off with the fanciest and the best. Just get the habit going. Dude, if you look at my initial videos, even you were like, bro, let's just put a bit of lighting on there. Like, I was just trying to record something and I just wanted to, I just wanted to get it out with enough value. Get it out. That's all I cared about. Because I wanted to teach myself to be comfortable being uncomfortable. That's all I wanted. To get in the habit of, I can actually do that. Now, three weeks down the line, I hope I, I'm a better communicator. I can get my point out quicker than I initially did. Yeah, and this is exactly why I wanted you just to start uploading, because the other stuff you can figure out later, the, the lighting, the angles, the microphone that you want to buy in the future. I told you this, my first 100 thousand followers or so on TikTok. I accumulated making videos in my Renault Megane. <laughs> and I had an iPhone 10 with a cracked front screen, sorry, a cracked front camera, which was blurry. People used to say, Ali, are you filming this video on a potato? People <laughs> used to mock it back in the day. But you know what? They stuck around, they watched the video, they commented, and I had a few videos with that crappy camera that got several million views. So it's not about the camera, it's, it's about the delivery of the message. People are out there crying for help, especially in the niche of self-improvement. There are so many people that are struggling in so many different ways. No, but AVH, I want you to give mm. yourself credit for something as well. You, put, you gave so much value on the front end. So when people see the end product now, and by the way, I just wanted to, you haven't even started yet, brother. Your success, I'm telling you, there's a different level. And you know that. You know that, brother. There's a different level coming, inshallah, by the grace of God. Absolutely. But you put in that work. So how foolish of it, how foolish would it be of me say, well, ABH, Ali's getting a thousand likes on his pictures. Okay. But Ali's also been doing it for two and a half years. Mm -hmm. You get invited to all these nice events, all these brand deals, etc. I can't compare my day one to your day... 700 and 700. something, yeah. Exactly. I can't. 
Because the comparison is a thief of joy. Yeah. And it's also unfair to compare uh, someone who's just started with somebody who's a seasoned uh, individual in, in their craft. And look, I consider myself still very early in the process as well because I'm, I told you this. My approach to the content game is a 10-year, 20-year approach. It's not a, well, let's just, let's just see how it goes. This mindset of let's just see how it goes, that might be helpful in the beginning to get you going. But afterwards, I mean, you need something to hold on to. I told you I've coached several people on content creation. They were all very pumped up in the beginning. I'm going to do watch me, Ali. I'm going to kick off. Some of them had a good head start as well. One guy that booked a call with me once had over 10,000 followers on TikTok. He was doing pretty well. He had a few videos that hit 400,000 views. On fucking TikTok, he had 10K followers. He had 10K followers. He had a few videos that were already in the hundreds of thousands of views in the past. So I told him, hey, latch on to that as well. You've done it before. You can do Bro, it again. If if he need any more evidence of what he can actually do or become, is he? Are you still mentoring him? Oh no, he quit. He quit the whole content thing. Doc, if you're listening, you need to re-engage this guy again. I'm fucking paying three times more, you loser. <laughs> I'm allowed to say that. Yeah, yeah. Tough love. Some tough love is important, dude. Yeah. Compassion and compression. Some people need compression. And then sometimes you need to give them compass- compassion. Mm. But Doc, on, on a serious note, man, if you had 10K followers on TikTok, fuck me. TikTok followers are hard, man. They'll come visit. They don't follow anything. But then I had to reframe that. I said, I need to. I took ownership of that. Mm. I said, I need to add more value. I need to be more valuable in the time I have for them to say, you know what? I'll give them my, I'll give them my time. Or my attention. That's what it is. I mean, attention is now the new currency, right? Attention is the new currency. How can you grab someone's attention? And eventually, if if entrepreneurship is, is the avenue for you, how can you monetize that attention? You know, being able to improve your communication skills is absolutely vital. But to get to a point where you are a charismatic speaker, where you're very impactful with your words in a short period of time, you need to be talking on a frequent basis. Someone asked me the other day, Ali, how can I improve my communication skills? And I told him, in the same way that you go to the gym every day, you need to communicate on a more frequent basis. And I'm not saying you FaceTime your friend and you say, yo, how's it going, man? No, I mean, put yourself in situations where you're practicing your speaking skills in a certain time frame. You know, whether it's a public speaking engagement where you've got 20 minutes to talk about a topic that you're passionate about and you need to be impactful in that 20 minutes because it's easy to waffle. It's easy to talk around in circles and, and go nowhere. And people, and you see this on YouTube, they give you the analytics. YouTube shows you when people click off the video and even TikTok does as well, to be fair. So you can get that feedback and you can look at it and think, wow, so people are clicking off because I must be talking a bunch of smack. I'm not getting to the point. When I first started making YouTube videos, I noticed I was doing that. I'll be talking about a certain topic, and then I just start waffling. But dude, you were, so correct me if I'm wrong, ABH. You were more addicted to the process than the outcome, right? Absolutely. From the very beginning, by the way. From the very beginning, I had this approach. So that's the difference. That's the difference between a normal person who's just doing it for the likes to someone who views himself as a professional with a 15 to 20 year horizon. Absolutely. I said this to a friend actually, who I spoke to a few hours ago. He was thinking of pursuing this side hustle and and I told him, is this really what you want to do? He said, well, it's going to make me some quick money right now. I said, listen, man, don't make that mistake. Sink your teeth into something and seek to become an expert at it. Don't fiddle around. There's so many fiddlers out there, dabblers. Fiddlers. You know, that sounds very predatory, right? But there's so many people that like to fiddle around with side hustles and online schemes. But they never, ever make anything out of themselves because they're always looking for a shortcut. And if you look for shortcuts, you get cut short. You need to find this is from Akala, by the way, lyric from Akala. But it's, it's so true. I used to be that guy in my early 20s. Same, I was trying man. to find something that could make me quick money. But that approach is just very limited. Limited and, and dude, 
And you see this in the workforce now. Mm. So many people, if they don't like something, they quit. They don't want to be professionals. They don't want the skill set to marinate. They don't want to work hard. If I don't get a certain pay rise by this time, I'm going to quit. Like what? And especially if it's frustrating when it's a young person who's 19, 20, 21, because they're just starting off. Why are you entitled to believe that you should be paid a certain amount of money? You're Dude, just starting oh. off. <sighs> entitled. Sorry to cut you, by the way. No, no, absolutely. Go Entitlement. Ahead. That's the word. That's the topic we need to discuss. Entitlement. Mm. You haven't done the work, but you expect to be paid like Joe Rogan. It's not even expect, it's demanding almost. I demand to be paid a good amount of money. Dem how are you demanding to be on a certain income when you haven't proven yourself to the marketplace? Dude. You know what my first salary was in a telesales job? I remember it was in Milton Keynes as well. My first salaried sales job was like 13,000 a year. I mean, it was poverty. I mean, the, the basic income, uh, what's the allowance? 12 and a half thousand, right? So I literally just got paid about a grand more than the allowance. Making money. Right? So, I mean, the tax <laughs> wasn't that high because I barely made anything, right? But I got into that environment as a rookie. And it was, with a, it was and I still talk about it, you know, very highly, despite the salary being crap. It was one of the most transformative experiences in my life because... It threw me in the deep and it forced me to learn how to communicate effectively in a short period of time. Because you've got 30 seconds on the phone. Dude, sales is probably the best skill that you could ever learn. <sighs> to become a top performing salesman, it's a skill set that needs to get sharpened on a daily basis. There's so much technique, there's so much learning to do. And it teaches you a lot about life as well. Because some quarters you're going to be great, the other quarter you're going to be shit. It's how do you keep a balance of your emotions and control your emotions. Mm. And my advice to any youngster out there, if you don't know what you're going to do, jump into a sales shop. Yeah. Jump Absolutely. in. Oh, the emotional roller coaster that you're going to have, brother. It's going to serve you. Especially you introverts. I mean, working in a telesales environment will shake you up. It will force you to interact with a huge volume of people and get... Look, a lot of people use the introvert word as a, like a badge of honor almost. Like, I'm an introvert. I can't be doing that. I'm an introvert. It's like a title that they've embraced. You know, it's like when women say, oh, I've got daddy issues. It's almost like a a badge of honor to, to justify their poor treatment of you. Oh, oh d don't mind me, I've got daddy issues. It's like, well, no, sweetheart. You know, yeah, you, you, know, you may have had daddy issues, but you're, you're 28 now. You can't be clinging on to that. You know? I'm the daddy now. <laughs> <laughs> you're talking to the daddy, right? <laughs> oh, shit. But that's the thing, man. I mean, uh, well, I saw, you know, speaking of this, actually, I saw a funny meme once. Uh, and it, got, it went along the lines of uh, when you're at the dinner table with her dad and she says, Daddy, can you pass me the salt? <laughs> and you both go for it. <laughs> oh, gosh. Oh, man. Dude, but, that'd be funny. I, oh, gosh. And the dad's going to be like, what? But no, it's just hilarious, man. But this is the thing. People, people cling on to the whole, I'm an introvert. I'm this. I've got ADHD. I've got... They, cling on, they cling on to these titles to justify why they're not where they want to be. You know, ADHD, for example, right? It's not a terminal disease that restricts it's a, you from... It's a, it's a superpower. There you go. Talk about it, man, because so many people that watch me have ADHD. I'm not saying, you know, this isn't the ADHD crew, but as in some people have mentioned in my comments before, Ali, I've got ADHD, I find it hard to do this, I find it hard to do that. Tell them, man. Brother or sister. It's mostly males. Like, there, there are a few girls, though, but it's yeah. mostly male, yeah. Guys, label them all, yeah? Mm. Guys, ADHD is a superpower. Embrace it. It's a superpower. It's a skill that needs to be honed. Because let me tell you this. As much as people say, oh, you can't do this, you can't do that. You're believing that. Ask me. Ali, you've seen me. Mm -hmm. You've seen me. How focused can I be? Scaringly focused. 
it's a it's a superpower, guys. Don't let people, don't let these losers tell you ADHD. So that means you're going to be a perennial failure in life. Fuck you. Watch me. That should be your attitude. Don't accept anything that these people say about ADHD. Don't accept any labels. It's a blessing and it's a superpower. You need to harness it the right way. Once you've harnessed it, and then you need to attack your purpose. Once you attack that purpose, you're unstoppable. You will be unstoppable. You can only be unstoppable if you do the work. You can't be lazy. Ain't nobody coming to save you. Do the work. Absolutely. I fully agree with the spot on. You know, with ADHD, and look, I'm no expert on, on ADHD, but I, I sympathize with the fear that some people have who do have ADHD, which is I can't trust myself to complete what I start. I find myself distracted quite a lot. But it's a case of forcing yourself to get on with it. But also, I think a lot of people with ADHD have this absolute dream of this that they somehow don't believe could make them a living or could be like a, a, a tangible avenue for them to pursue. And they're usually very creative. They've got so many great ideas. It's a trust thing. It's not trusting themselves to make this thing work. But it's, you know, like, for example, I have a friend of mine who's got ADHD, excellent musician. You don't have to tell him to pick up the guitar. He picks up the guitar. He's very good at it. Why is he doing that? Why is he doing that? Because that's his purpose. He's a musician. That's of interest to him. Exactly. Exactly. And that's the thing that if he was just sim to simply sink his teeth into it and find a way to make money from it, he could. Now, I'm not saying that he's a world-class musician, but there's so many people with ADHD who have something that they're actually really good at that they could make money from. Dude, they better operate better than most people. When they're hyper-focused, I think that's one of the, the symptoms, right? If you have an ADHD and you're able just to lock in on something. Ali, you've seen me, brother. What do you describe me as? Oh, your, your discipline and work ethic is remarkable, honestly. The consistency of it as well is it's amazing to see. And that's down to my ADHD. I'm not letting that shit hold me back. I'm not letting some person who doesn't know me to say, because of your ADHD, you will never amount to anything. You know what's funny? The majority of people with ADHD, if you were to have never told them that they have it, they wouldn't cling on to it as an excuse. Facts. You know, just think about that for a second. There's people in impoverished nations who have ADHD, but they're not wearing it as some sort of disability. They're not holding on to it. I can't accomplish anything. They're getting on with things. And I think that's the thing. A lot of these people that use it as an excuse if they were to have never known that they had it they probably wouldn't use it as an excuse they'd go out there and work hard and yeah some things might have confused them like why can't i seem to but they would, they would just find a way to do it dude that's my issue with the critical race theory why are we telling children like i'm south asian i'm pakistani why are we telling certain children whether you're from the bain community that you can't be certain things Therefore, a particular sect of people. That's the most disturbing and horrific thing you could ever tell a child. You can be anything that you want as long as you make that contract with yourself and work extremely hard, simple, and you're passionate about that. Why are we telling these young children that certain jobs aren't for them? You can't be an entrepreneur or you can't be a content creator. You can't be a baker because, or you can't be a chef. Why are we telling these people that? Because you have got a di different skin tone? How about we say, okay, you could be anything 
as long as you're putting, putting the work in. Meritocracy. Mm. Why, why, why aren't we talking about this? Yeah, yeah. And I think it's up to the parents of today to instill this belief into their children that they can accomplish anything, anything they put their mind to. Not delusion, not telling your kids, oh, you don't have, you know, as long as you believe it, no, no, no. Son, you're going to have to focus. You're going to lose a lot. You're going to fall on your face. As long as you don't quit, you haven't lost. Yeah, don't fucking tell your children to be wolves. They will never be wolves. Like, come on, man. There needs to be some element of realism there. You can't just tell children, you could be a flower if you want to identify as a flower. Like, come on, man. Fucking mm -hmm. let's get real here. Dude, I know one thing. My children are going to be little savages. My little Belle, who I visualize, give me hugs every day. She's going to be a little savage. My sons, they're going to be savages. My daughters, they're going to be savages. Because they have a savage as a father. Oh, yes, sir. You know, they're learning from watching you. Kids Dude. are like, they absorb their environment. Dude, even when you think that they're not, they are. They're picking up things all the time. Dude, my, my motivation, my niece and nephew, they're my motivations. And then I visualize my daughter, my mm. belt. Yeah. I don't want to be that fat, fucking lumpy dad on school sports day. You know when they do the parents run? Mm. I don't want to be that unfit fuck who can't run. Mm. I want to be like, yeah. Daddy just gave everyone a piece of him. Yeah, he, anyone, by the way. Mm. And you know what, touching on you know, running and fitness, your journey has been incredible. Share with the audience I mean, how much weight you've lost in the last few months. And I mean, this guy's work ethic in the gym, disgusting. He tells me about his routines in the gym and amazing. So a share your weight loss journey. ABH got out of the leg day. Yeah, well, we were supposed to have a leg day together, to be fair, last week. Fuck that, dude. That but, was brutal. Yeah. Well, good thing you, you got away with it. I didn't. <laughs> But yeah, share, share with the audience your weight loss journey. So guys, I was 365 pounds. So that's 26 and a half stones. And I don't care what anyone says. Being that fat and obese ain't fun. You are torturing yourself every day. You have no control of your life. You're limited to the fucking clothes that you wear. And... That's it. I've lost over approaching. Let me just do quick math. Because hmm. I've just weighed myself this morning. Just let me. Bring the mic down a little bit as well. That's it. You want to see my pretty face, Shane? See if we can see that beautiful face. That's it, sir. <laughs> this podcast is very kindly sponsored by the gentleman at Glownode. If you are an aspiring trader who would like to gain access to capital to further progress your trading career, take a look at Glownode. They provide you with several options when it comes to funding. Once you pass your assessment, your evaluation uh, phase with them, you have access to capital ranging from 10000 all the way up to $200,000 in funding. I've dropped the details down in the link below. Yeah, weight loss is definitely a conversation that... So I've lost over 80, 80 pounds. Wow, in how long? It, just under a year. That's amazing. That's 80 amazing. pounds. That's 80 incredible. pounds in just under a year. And how has it changed your life? Dude, it's given me self-belief. It's changed everything. My, out, my outlook... Just everything, man. Just fucking everything. You know, I used to wake up with pain in my lower back, couldn't walk. I used to walk up the stairs, feel like I'm going to fucking die. Dude, it was horrible. It 
it's like you're you're torturing yourself on a daily basis. You talk about fucking abuse, you're abusing yourself. Dude, not having control over what you put in your mouth is the biggest punishment you could ever give anyone. Bro, it's not like crack cocaine that you need to go out there, illicit subject, oh, you need to get a phone. Dude, I can walk into Sainsbury's for 20p, I can satisfy my sweet tooth. Mm. Yeah. That's torture. But you know what? It has to come to... I hit rock bottom, man. Emotionally, physically, spiritually. I hit rock bottom. And it was only then I changed the pain of being in that same situation. When, when was the turning point for you? Bro, it's not like I've been fat or morbidly obese throughout my life. I've had periods where I've gotten great shape. But I could never be consistent. I could never fucking be consistent. I'm 6'1", I'm big dude, right? Athletic, I used to play uh, sports. So I was in great shape. Then life happens. Then you lose yourself. Dude, it got to a point, and one of my biggest regrets, and you talk about regrets, bro. Remember when I had that conversation with you when we were at that sky bar? Mm. And I said, bro, one thing I definitely want to give my mom is that joy in her eyes when I get my MBA. I just want to give her that. And you know why? Because my graduation, I was so unhappy with the way I looked. I never took any pictures. Real talk. I never took any pictures. And I just want to distance myself from that individual. I was fucking obese then, and I hated myself. I was depressed, and I just, I just want nothing to do with that part of my life. Would you say you robbed yourself of the joy of the experience by feeling this way about yourself? A million percent, man, a million percent. Like, if you could go back in time to that Hassan, would you say something different to him? Would you tell him, hey, man, just enjoy the day, bro. You, you graduated, man. You put in a lot of hard work at uni. No, bro. Or would you? I wouldn't. Why not? Very simply, I wouldn't. I'll tell you why. Because even in uni, I coasted. I, I wasn't intentional about my education then. So that Hassan didn't deserve to be on the stage. Mm. He did not deserve to be on that stage. Now, if I go uni, and when I go uni to do my MBA, I want to give my mom that happiness that she deserves. Inshallah, by the grace of God, either from Harvard, Inshallah. either from Harvard or Oxford, London Business School, any of these top schools, I'm going to get an MBA from there. Just to give my mom that happiness. Mm. And what um, what is that happiness to you? Is it you being a certain weight, or is it what is it? Do just to relive that. You know, people have my. This is what people don't understand. You know, grievance, bereavement, emotions, or not understanding emotion, affection, in very different ways. And at that point in my life, I was so lost. I had no purpose. I wanted to achieve so much in my life. I wanted to be somebody. But my work ethic was dog shit. I was, like you said, man, looking for that quick hit. Trying to get onto new thing. Never settling down. And being intentional, never mastering my craft. That's a huge problem for a lot of men. And many that are watching this video. I wanted to be, I want, dude, I wanted to be in the Ferrari Lambo with the beautiful girls, this, that. I wanted to be the Asian Dan Bilzerian. I wanted that life. But your work ethic 
said my something work else. ethic was dude it was dog shit so why and that cognitive dissonance fucking kills you inside when you got these lofty ambitions and then you look at yourself in the mirror you can't hide from yourself oh. you know I, I just want to say this that you can't hide from yourself you can't you can't run away from who you are you've got you for the rest of your life and if you're somebody who isn't putting in the work you can't rest well at night. So you have to, as you mentioned, you have to look at yourself in the mirror and keep it real. Am I who I say I am? You know, most people talk left and walk right. And ABH, you know the only person you could truly blame in this life is the man that looks back at you in the mirror. No one else. No one else. You could have the shittest experience you can have. Here's a parable. You must have come across that story of there's a uh, there's an alcoholic father has two sons. One of them turns out to be a drunk. The other one never touches alcohol. 20 years down the line, they ask him, why did you become who you became? One's never touched alcohol. The other one's an alcoholic like his father. Both of them said, because of our dad. Mm. There comes a point in life where you need to make peace with what's ever happened, whatever's happened in the past. You need to make peace with that. And then you need to accept one thing. I need to change. Whatever's happened, it stops with me. And it's not going to continue. So whatever, whatsoever, whatever's happened in the past, you've just got to have the confidence that you will change. And you don't change immediately. You don't become an athlete, a high performance guy. Just like that. You've got to take baby steps. But you, it's on you to change. Yeah, absolutely. Personal responsibility. You must accept 100% responsibility for where you are in life. And yes, it may not be your fault that your father was an alcoholic, but you bloody well should ensure that you don't become one in the future because you don't want to put your kids through the same torment that you went through. You know, people cling on to childhood trauma and they use it as an excuse not for them to have a better life. They say, well, you know, this is just who I am. I come from a fucked up family and, but it doesn't have to be this way. You don't have to subject your kids to the same trauma that you were subjected to. If your father was hitting your mother, you can make a decision not to be that guy. Detach yourself from that experience and be like, you know what? I don't want to be like my dad. Brother, you got two choices, right? Either you become that or you become the change. Mm. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? That's a very, very good question. So what you, you do? have to mm -hmm. make that decision that you're either going to become that person and live with the consequences or either you're going to change and then live with the consequences. Either way, there will be consequences. What do you want to do? Mm -hmm. That's true. That's very true. That's very true. I fully agree with that. There will be consequences, either good or bad. You know, I said this before, right, in a conversation we had at the, at the lounge. Time will either promote you or expose you. Oh, bro, that fucking scared me. That shit scared me. <laughs> I, like, yeah. that shit scared the living daylights out of me. Yeah. You know, when I first hit, I heard that quote, it hit me like a ton of bricks as well. Either you will be promoted in a positive way as time goes by, oh, and demoted. you will reap the rewards... Or you will be exposed for your lack of effort, for your fraudulent nature. You know, where you are in life is a result of the things that you did or didn't do. There, there are so many men who resent themselves, who are sat in a cubicle 
at a corporation that they feel unfulfilled in. And the reason why they're mad at themselves isn't because of the nature of the job. It's because they made a promise to themselves seven years prior that I'm going to take charge of my life. I don't want... Maybe they got laid off seven years ago. And that experience was very humiliating. And they promised themselves never again. But they didn't follow through on that promise. They didn't make a new action. They weren't decisive. They just carried on in the same way that they were before. Dude, can I just touch on that, right? Very valid point that you made. And I think more people need to understand that. Because the easiest thing that gets thrown around is entrepreneur, entrepreneur. Why are you entrepreneur? Why are you entrepreneur? Dude. Being an entrepreneur is probably the hardest thing in the world. Absolutely. It's not easy. Mm -mm. But how are you going to be successful when your daily habits, you're so ungrateful for the job that you have. You're so ungrateful. Your habits are not consistent with your vision. So if you're a shit worker with a shit work ethic, you think you're going to be a, a high performance entrepreneur? That's the thing. People don't, people forget that everything affects everything. Your poor performance in your nine to five job. And it's, when I say poor performance, I, I'm not talking so much about KPIs. I'm talking about your attitude at work. If your attitude stinks. If your mindset is the mindset of I'll do just enough to get paid, but not enough to excel, then that mindset will spill into what you do on the side. So even if there's a project that you're pursuing, a business that you want to start on the side, you're not going to be a high achiever because of that weasel mentality. Dude, a lot of people are afraid of competition. A lot of people are afraid of competition. But the beauty of... See, if you're a bit of a twisted individual like myself, you welcome a bit of competition. Because I know the mindset I have... Dude, I'm not the most skilled person in the world. But one thing I can say about myself is A, I'm too dumb to quit. Secondly, I've got that dog in me. I'm like a fucking rabid dog. And all I need is a reason to just go and I'm default aggressive. That's all I need. Because I expect more of me than anyone else could expect. That's it. Your expectation of yourself, because I love me very much, I demand a lot from me. And dude, I don't expect people to love me. There's many people who I don't get on with or they don't, they don't gel with me because it's like they're not bad people. It's just we're on completely different wavelength. Well, that's what it is, especially, I mean, I think it was Jeff Bezos that said this, that if you don't want any criticism, do nothing and be nothing in life. You know, uh, anyone that's daring to venture outside of the box will receive criticism. People will look at you funny and say, hey, how comes you've changed? Who do you think you are now? Some big shot, yeah? You know, and, and unfortunately, so many people, the moment they receive that criticism... Oh, no, 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 no I, I, I didn't mean to appear different to you guys. Oh, okay, fine, I'll, I'll, I'll stop doing this thing. And they'll go back to how they were because they're afraid of the backlash. But you must dare to receive the backlash. You must embrace it and be like, you know what, this is part of change. The greatest compliment that you could ever receive in your life is you've changed. Believe you me, that's the greatest compliment you'll ever receive. You've changed. Yeah, motherfucker. I ain't trying to be like you. I'm not trying to go back to that place. It's not a badge of honor. It's, uh, I've changed, yes. Because there's people who rely on me. There's people who I need to provide for. I've changed, yes. Absolutely. So I'm not going to go waste my money and be with toxic people that I don't even like. 
I would rather be alone, dude. And if your partner doesn't like it, cool, find a new one. There's a great quote by Coach Nick Saban, the winningest coach in college NFL. You know I love NFL, mm -hmm. American football, right? He says, mediocre people don't like high achievers and high achievers don't like mediocre people. If you understand that, dude, that's that, that simple. It's... Mm. That solves a lot of your problems. Dude, I don't, I don't expect people to say, oh, Hassan, you're the best. You're, you're, you're so good. Dude, I want people to be like, yeah, he's fucking weird. Like, mm -hmm. he's weird. I don't like him. All right, cool, man. I'm not for everyone. I'm okay with that. Exactly. You know, there's a quote that says, if you want to make everybody happy, sell ice cream. But even then, I think that needs to change because someone will complain, oh, you don't have dairy-free, you know. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's the thing. There's always someone that's going to complain. There's there's always no going to be some. No gluten-free sprinkles. The animals, you know, that's it's mean because the cows don't get to chew. It's like, okay, you can't Listen, make everybody happy. Bro, I need my beef, though, so it's going to make me happy. I need my steak, baby. <laughs> yes, sir. So, like sir, man, too many people are scared of judgment. Mm, that is one of the most crippling things, man, is it's the fear of other people's judgment. But once you step free from that, life is just completely different for you. It's a completely different experience when you can live your life not worried about what other people have to say. But ABH, think about it, man. When you started this journey, how many people are, what are you fucking Joe Rogan now? How oh, I received my fair bit of uh, backlash in the early stages. I remember there was this one guy in particular that was like, oh, you'll never get a thousand followers. And he, he kept saying that. And you know what? I think he was my number one fan. Looking back now, you know, there's a, there's a saying, a hater is a confused admirer. Oof. You can say that again, brother. Can we have a repeat of that? Can we run that back, please? Absolutely. A hater is a confused admirer. And that's, uh, that's so true. Because there's something about you, as we spoke about earlier, that they admire, but they can't seem to process a compliment. So they resort to spewing nonsense. That nonsense, they want to direct it themselves. <sighs> But instead, it goes out on you. But he was he was somebody in particular who was, oh, you'll never, you'll never. And I did it. I did it 150 times on TikTok. Got 1,000 followers 150 times. And uh, and even on, Insta uh, on Instagram and YouTube, things started kicking off. I feed off that shit. I like it when someone says, ah, you won't. Yeah, I you're take a sick that shit individual, I'm, I'm, I'm a psycho, bro. You're, you're a sick individual like me. <laughs> Something's not right with me up here. I've always it's been good, that kind bro. of guy. That's good. We I must have been dropped as a kid a few times because there's something not quite right up there. Or not loved. <laughs> or not loved, yeah. <laughs> I needed Can more hugs, it, right? That's it, brother, that's it. But, you know, honestly, man, I, I feed off that shit. I really do. I love a good bit of criticism. You know, there was someone recently, actually, who said, uh, does everybody in, uh, and he mentioned where I lived in my area. He said, does everybody in your, and I know this is someone that maybe I went to school with, but I don't recognize the name. But he said, does everyone in your area sound like a something like a over-the-top posh prick or something? I don't know what he said. Uh, something along those lines, right? I bet you that motherfucker wants to be you. I guarantee you that. Well, I took it as an Im immense compliment because... He is, well. Him criticizing how I speak, you know, for me, that's, that's a compliment to my speaking ability over the years. Of course. That it's improved drastically. For him to focus specifically on that. Does everybody speak as, as much of a posh prick as you? Oh, so what he meant to say was, man, I really like how eloquent you are with your words. And I'm mad that I'm not as eloquent as you. So Facts. instead of giving you a compliment, let me take my anger out on you, which actually is, is anger that I should direct at myself. For, you know, for my lack of worth. For my lack of input. Yeah, exactly. Work ethic and input. And that's what it is. You know, someone that's mad at you for going to the gym and taking care of yourself is mad at themselves for not having the courage to do that. But they want to take it out on somebody. They want to find someone to blame and point the finger at and say, you, who do you think you are to do that? You know, you know what they should do? They should look themselves in the mirror and say, am I that perfect? If not, then just be quiet, man. Just be quiet. Mm. All right. Here's a question for you, brother. I know 
this is a podcast where you're asking me. I'm going to ask you a question because I'm always interested in asking successful people. What makes you tick, man? Because I know one thing about you. You're not normal. You can say that again. <laughs> yeah. But I mean that in the greatest yeah. compliment way, yeah? What makes you tick? It's a good question. I hold myself to a very high standard and it wasn't always this way, Mm. but as I became to, as I came to care more about myself and love more uh, and love myself more, I demanded more of myself and what makes me tick is the results. You know, I consider myself like a great white shark. When I get a taste of the blood, I come back for more. I do a little, I swim away and I come back for another chunk of the flesh. That's me. So a question I get asked quite a lot is, you know, what kept you going over the last two years making content? Now, you got to remember in the beginning, there were no significant results for me to hold on to and be like, oh, yeah. It took me a while to start getting 100 views, 200 views. In, in my YouTube videos, I was getting five, six likes in the beginning, 10 likes. So what, what kept me going? was the impact that I was creating. And I, I just fell in love with the results. And I told myself, wow. And I remember the, and I celebrated along the way. That's interesting. I celebrated the mini wins. And that kept me going. A lot of people don't give themselves any opportunity to celebrate. In fact, they don't even recognize their wins. And I always tell people, slow down. You know, you've been accomplishing a great deal. Mm. You, you sold your product to the first 10 customers. That's something to celebrate. Your first 10 subscribers, that's 10 people subscribing. These are real people sat somewhere pressing the subscribe button. Celebrate that. So I was celebrating along the way. Oh, because everyone is looking at Mr. Beast. They're looking at yourself. Why can't I have 20,000 followers? Mm, there's a long way to go, Buttercup. Mm. There's a long way to go. And this is why it's important to ask the question, why are you doing this? You know, you, you've read the book Start With Why by Simon Sinek. Yes, sir. Transformational book. Most people work from the outside in, not from the inside out. Dude, that, that in itself, your why, is all you need. Really and truly. But that comes from clarity, ABH. If you're not even clear about your vision or purpose, how are you going to come to you, the destination? Or destination in the sense is your why. Why? Mm. You have no reason to come to that conclusion. You have no business to come to that conclusion. How on earth are you going to define your why when you're so lost and lost yourself? This is why it's so important for people to pause and to write it down. You know, and make it an emotional why. You know, someone once told me, your why should make you cry. It should be way bigger than you. You know, if it's just about you and the Lambos and the penthouses, you'll quit. But if it's about something even bigger than that, then, and especially when it's fundamentally connected to people that you deeply care about. You know, as men, we can let ourselves down all day long. But when we got a little girl at home who's like, Daddy, I miss you. It's a completely different conversation. Dude. It's a completely different work ethic. Dude. What you've just said there right now, if people don't even listen to what we've said, all podcasts, right? But they just rewind and listen to what you just said. They can transform their life. Today. They can transform their life. What you've just said. Rewind another 30 seconds. That's the fucking secret of why this man's successful. That's the fucking secret there. What he's just given you? Dude, you should charge for that fucking advice. And I do. And I'll be doubling my prices very soon, guys. So book a coaching call down below. But, you know, it's uh, it was very transformational for me. And I appreciate the kind words, you know. But when your why is very emotional, man, you carry yourself differently. And men are willing to conquer lands when their reason is strong enough. 
they will do they will cross oceans you know but when your reason is superficial oh, i want to buy this okay when it gets hard you, you won't you won't carry on you'll quit it's a very surface level reason it was nietzsche who said the one who has a why can be any who anyhow mm. very powerful very very powerful and you're up you're up against a completely different caliber of man when he has a strong why and you don't you will be crushed dude. every day of the week dude if you're up against a man who knows why he's doing something and you're like oh well you know i'll try it i'll give it a go you will get obliterated there are dangerous men out there and i'm talking about dangerous in the sense of serial entrepreneurs Serial athletes. Who will if you have crush any, they will you. sense the weakness in you and they will bounce your head off the canvas. And take pleasure in doing that. Yeah. Because there's nothing more rewarding than putting they the numbers They will grab up. your head and raise it after they have just slaughtered you. As like a gladiator. This is the thing. This is why you must have a strong reason. As I was saying, if you don't have a reason, you're only here for a season. Oh. Run that back, ABH. You know, if you don't have a reason, you're only here for a season. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So it's got to be something strong that you cling on to that you remember. I'm picking that up, by the way. You know? I'm picking it up. I'm telling you, brother. I mean, longevity. And this is this the, the, the way you know whether someone has a strong reason is longevity most of the time because they're still doing it. And you know what? Not just longevity. Longevity connected to a very optimistic attitude. Mm-hmm. Those two can Facts. connect it together. If they've been doing it for a long time with the same level of optimism, that's a person that has a strong reason. All of these kids now that want to start these drop shipping and this and this, first of all, they they dabble around with it, they fiddle with it for a couple of months, and then they, they, they stop doing it. I'm, they, when someone tells me, oh, Ali, I'm going to start doing this, I'm like, okay. I, I smile, not in a derogatory way, but okay, because I've heard it before. I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. and I, Okay. And then I catch up with them eight months down the line. Oh, Ali, I'm going to start doing And I'm like, there we go. There was a lot of excitement. You know, Jim Rohn says it, right? This, this is why motivation alone isn't enough. Because if, if there's an idiot and you motivate him, now you've got a motivated idiot. Motivation <laughs> alone isn't enough, right? <laughs> you must apply. You must act. Mm. You know, Jim Rohn talks about one of the, the fundamentals that changes life, which is get serious. Suck. Just those two words, get serious, for goodness sake. Some of, these, some of these guys that watch my podcast are in their 30s, still casual, still, well, hopefully soon. Get serious. If not now, then when? When are you going to make that step? Now. No time like now. Because as I said, time will either promote you or expose you. Dude, very similar, in the similar effect, I have my own way of dealing with things, right? I say, own it. Mm. No matter what season you're in, own it. Elaborate on that. Own it in what sense? Simple. If you're overweight, own it. If you're getting success, you're making that money, own it. But don't own it in the sense, oh, yeah, I'm the shit. Nothing's going to happen. No, 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 no. Own the process that got you there. Mm. Own the inputs that got you there. It's like initially, it's like the bell curve, right? When people start a new venture endeavor, I hope you, you guys are intelligent people. You know what bell curve is. If you don't. Like I said again, you shouldn't be watching this fucking show. <laughs> like, initially, everyone's like, I'm going to start a new venture. Cool, cool, cool. They'll do all the reading. They'll put the work in this. Uh, they start getting some traction. They can start getting a bit of success. This, this, this. Now they get comfortable. Then all the behaviors that led them to that success, it comes down. And then it's fucking pandemonium. It's like, what? What the fuck's happening? What? 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 Dude, you forgot the fundamentals. The behaviors that got you to that stage, you never implemented them. You got complacent and comfortable. 
that resulted in shitty results, shitty outcomes. That's so powerful, man. People stopped doing the things that got them the results because of comfort. And then what happens is you start going backwards. Because I've said it in a video before. In life, you're either getting better or getting worse. There's no middle ground. If you stop training today, your body doesn't stay frozen in time the way it is right now. You will deteriorate physically. If you don't actively work to increase your income, you'll lose money. Because, for example, if you're in sales and you stop putting in the effort, you'll think, oh, no, I'm just going to stop now. They start looking at your performance. Hang on a second. Your performance isn't what it used to be. You start going backwards, and then eventually you could be fired. Dude, sales are a very great example. It's funny you mentioned this, right? I was thinking about it. Now, when you initially get, get on the sales line, you're prospecting that crazy, crazy, crazy emails app. Boom, boom, boom. Your behaviors are extreme, right? Four weeks, six weeks down the pipeline, you get some traction. Now you're getting some bite packs. You start converting. Now you start to hit some numbers. Cool, cool, cool. Now all of a sudden, your pipeline's full. You hit your targets. Next quarter, your pipeline's looking, getting drier, 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 and you're thinking, what the hell's happened here? Is it the, oh, people aren't buying because if it's summer and the buying, it's the, it's the winter, there's a flood in Bangladesh. Like, uh, no, I think you're forgetting something. You stopped prospecting. You forgot the fundamentals once again. So it wasn't the wave you caught. It was the behaviors that enabled mm. you to get to that stage. Facts. So, so you need. So life is very simple when you start looking at it from a very logical stance. Mm -hmm. It's not this great conspiracy Oh, they want you poor, this, that. No, you want yourself poor. That's an excuse a lot of people cling on to, especially nowadays. They don't want to see you in the Matrix and this and... It's like, bro, no, you're just fucking lazy. You're just lazy. Oh, dude, this Matrix thing is just like fucking overridden. Like, what yeah, the I know fuck? a lot of people like watching Andrew Tate and stuff, but there are so many young boys now, man, who are like, oh, man, they, they don't want to see... Bro, your work ethic is dog shit. They don't want to see you win. Motherfucker, you ain't won, never won in your life. Yeah. What winning, bro? What do you mean, oh, they don't want to see you win? You haven't won anything <coughs> recently. You know what I mean? Dude, but... <laughs> it's hilarious, bro, because... Look, I, I used to be that way back in the day, man. I used to say all these corny quotes and stuff. And, you know, one of the most transformative things for me was when I started to look at the numbers. I became a numbers guy. And maybe it was because of my experience in sales over the years, I started to really focus on the numbers. Instead of just me thinking that I'm doing well, what do the numbers say? How many deals have I closed? How much money is in my account? I can't, st start, I can't continue feeding myself lies, telling myself, oh no, I'm grinding, bro, I'm hustling. Your life's the same as it was a year ago. And that's scary. You know, the, the quote I, I shared with you, time will either promote you or expose you. When I heard that quote many years ago, it struck something in me, a nerve in me. I was like, man, if I'm not careful, I will be deluded by my activity. Denzel said this, actually. He said, don't mistake movement for progress. And Thanks. I was, for the, for the longest time, I was just thinking that I was progressing because I was out and about in cafes, looking up business models online and stuff. And I mistook that, listening to podcasts, I mistook that for progress. And although all of that stuff is good, that, that stuff is sharpening the axe time, reading books, listening to audio books. That's sharpening the axe. When are you hitting the tree? And at the end of it, you have to look at the result. Did the tree go down or not? If it didn't go down, that's not a result. You can't be celebrating. Woo, I tried to hit the tree down. Okay, you tried. Effort is the bare minimum. You know, nowadays, and Andy Frazella actually talks about this. Nowadays, people celebrate showing up. That's the bare fucking minimum. Oh, I lo oh, love, uh, I lo oh, man. You took the words out of my mouth. When people say, I'm a hard worker. What the fuck does that even mean? I'm a hard worker. Like, is there any other option? Is there any other option? So, when it's you... It's almost like they're fishing for a trophy. Give me a trophy. It's like, no, no, no. 
We're not going to give you a participation trophy. We'll give you a trophy if you win something. The old school way. Not the new school soft. No, at least give him a, a trophy for trying a sticker. No, 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 no. Dude, like, by the grace of God, I'm telling you this, right? I'm so grateful that my dad showed me competitiveness. That he, he was an athlete himself, so that competitiveness was in me and trying to win. But I was not always like this. So I've been guilty of just doing the bare minimum as well. But then something happens in your life and it makes you tick. And then you realize, shit, all these people that were like, you're good, you're good. No one's there. You look around, ain't nobody there, brother. And it's just you. Mm -hmm. And it's you and that man is either proud or ashamed. No. What is the thing? I mean, you can give yourself the illusion of winning as much as you want. But at the end of the day, you're by yourself. You're sitting on the edge of your bed. And you know whether you're a failure or a success. You know that. And dude, people, people assume winning is only monetary. Mm. Like when they say, oh, I don't need a bigger house. <laughs> I'm, I, I love this place. Dude, fair enough. If that's the real truth, but if you've got visions of you want to be in Wentworth Estate in Surrey, right? But you're here living somewhere which is not where you want to be, but you're feeding yourself a lie. That's the biggest torturous thing that you could ever do. At least be honest with yourself what you truly want. Mm-hmm. For a lot of people, they say things like that because they're afraid of trying. Right. However, if it, like, as you mentioned, if it is the genuine reason, then that's great. I mean, that, that means they have a lot of self-awareness. Because, look, success doesn't mean orange Lambo and a mansion. You know, Earl Nightingale defines it as the progressive realization of a worthy ideal. If that's what they deem to be worthy to them, if being a teacher in a primary school, making the kids laugh and... You know, sharing wonderful stories. If that if that is something that's fulfilling to them, then they're a success in my books. Brother, that... See, man, th this is where I have an issue with social media. Because people just see the end product. They don't see the hard work somebody puts in to get to that place where they're in the PJ, where they, where they have the luxurious... They don't understand what that person sacrificed. Mm. And because I've met very successful people who are successful monetary wise, but they're unhappy. So they lack fulfillment, isn't it? So if, if you tell me you could be fulfilled, but as a firefighter, but that's, that's what you truly want, brother, you're winning. You're winning. You're richer than the dude who has a mansion, Bruv. but it's unfulfilled. But here's the caveat. If you're an ambitious person and you're living below what you envision for yourself, that's fucking torture as well. That's more dangerous than anything. And it's the one word that gets them fear. Fear of judgment. Fear of letting what people are going to say. Who gives a fuck what they're going to say? I can tell you this, man. Whether you're winning or you're losing, people still going to have something to say. So why the fuck would you not want to protect your sanity and really go after what you truly want? Why wouldn't you want to do that? Mm. That's the thing. And courage isn't the absence of fear. It's acting despite the fear. It's taking action despite the fear. The fear will always be there to an extent. Whenever you begin anything that you haven't done before, a new endeavor, you're always going to have a, some level of doubt. But for a lot of people, I want to tell them this, that it's not difficult, it's new. It's just uncharted territories. You know, you're, you're unfamiliar. 
people are the reason why people are afraid of uh, watching horror movies. A lot of people are afraid is because of the unknown. But A B H, how many how many things in life that were scary before until you experienced them? Oh, many things. So why don't we use the same same example, same evidence? Say, hey, shit, man, cooking an egg once upon a time. Driving. You remember your, your first time driving? You were like, oh, God, you know, man, you were clutch. Dude, I was, I, was, I was a nightmare. Bro, I failed uh, three times, passed on my fourth attempt. I remember my first driving test, I stalled on the roundabout. It was a busy roundabout in Bedford. I think it was Cardington roundabout, actually. And I stalled on the roundabout, not just before I got onto it. When I was on it, I stalled. And I remember when I retook my, when I did my third test, after I failed at the end of my third test, I thought, man, I'm never driving. Bro, these guys don't like me. <laughs> I felt cursed, bro. I was like, I'm never driving a car. And then thankfully on the fourth time, on the fourth attempt, I passed, you know? So this is the thing, man, it's, you've got to, you've got to keep persisting. You've, you've got to have the courage to try again. Dude, now here's the thing. You know how easy it is to win in life? Especially now, when everyone is so mentally weak. How easy it is to win now? I'm excited, man. People are thinking, oh, it's going to be the worst time. I'm like, fucking bring it on. I want to touch on that, actually. Because a lot of people say something along the lines of, uh, oh, it's too saturated. There's too many people doing it. Just because there's a lot of people doing it, it doesn't mean they're doing it effectively. Dude, I welcome the competition. I want him to be, because I know what I bring to the table. I, I, dude, let me tell you this, right? I want it to be competitive. I want it to be competitive. So many people are afraid of competition. Mm. They get competition anxiety. Oh, no. Uh, the, he's doing it, but all right, cool. The only difference is time. And it's always crowded at the bottom. You're going to get millions of people trying to do the same thing. But if you put your head down, these people are going to start dropping. Year one, people are going to drop. Year two, people are going to drop. Year three, less people now. If you come to year five, brother... Limited people. It's a very, very small circle. This is the thing, man. And it all stems from... Sorry, ABH. Mm -hmm. Just on that. And then you got that time element, right? Then you put that work ethic into it. Oh, you're fucking unstoppable. Think about it. You know the reason why I wake up at 4 a.m.? Why is that? Hmm? Why is that? Shall I give you the real answer or should you give me the politically correct answer? Give me the raw, unfiltered answer. Because I know it does something to me psychologically, right? Because I know there's people, there's fucking 98% of the people who aren't willing to do what I'm going to do, wake up, whether I'm tired, sore as fuck, Calves are hurting. I'm still showing up. That's a see. This is the thing. This is what I love about people that wake up really early. And this is why, when you mentioned it to me for the first time, I was like, "Man, you're cut from a different cloth." Because that's a very uncomfortable thing to do, dude. It's the worst thing. Four a.m. Most people are like deep in, in their deep sleep in that time. Okay. Now, if I do it consistently, year one, <laughs> year two. And then my skill sets are improving. I'm becoming more effective operator. Boom, boom, boom. It's not even fair at that point. Dude, the separation that's going to happen in year three, year four, when people are just lagging behind, it's going to be different. And that's all I, that's all I need. Why do you do it? 
So what, what is it for you, about, especially about waking up at four? Why couldn't it be five or six? Why four? Is Gratitude. it because you're deliberately seeking the most uncomfortable experience to... Yeah, 100%. Is that what it is? That's not the only reason. That's not the only reason. It's logic. If I can get the hardest thing out the way that anything life throws at me during the day, it's easy. Dude, try doing squats at 4.30 or 5 a.m. in the morning. It's fucking difficult. Especially when the weather is cold, windy, wet, and you still show up, different. Second reason I do it for, I want to create this habit, this mentality. I want to callous my mind, irrespective of what the conditions are. We stick to the routine. You control the controllables. You control the variables. So emotions don't even come into it. Mm -hmm. It's never about me. And th there are days, dude, God's honest truth. Today, I was sore as fuck. I did not want to work out. I would have rather done anything than work out. But I still did it. Oh, fuck me. It's never about me. My family's, my future family's relying on me. Mm. I just imagine Belle. She's looking at me. Come on, daddy. Just, just that vision of me being a fat slob, like I was before, it was enough for me to say, nah, fuck that dude, I'm too scared to go back. And people need to understand that, dude, I didn't become 365 pounds just because I woke up one morning, I had had a couple of pizzas, and I was 365. No. It was accumulation of bad habits, bad mindset, comfort, that got me to that stage. Same with getting it off. I wouldn't have done it in one year. I said, fuck it. It takes me, whether it takes me 10 years, two years, one year, six months, one month. I'm committed to the process. That's, that's all I give a shit about, really. And that validation that I give myself through my daily actions, that's why I do it. Because I want to make myself proud. And how do you feel going to bed every night? Fulfilled. God's only truth, dude. If I was to go now, if God was to take me now, I'd be happy. You know why? Because I've done everything I put my mind to today. And not yesterday, mm. not tomorrow, today. But God willing, I've got long innings. God willing, inshallah, yeah. Inshallah. But like... If I was to go now, right now, I'd go happy. I'm fulfilled. Man, I love that. I love that. And unfortunately, so many people can't say that about themselves. They can't say that, you know what? I'm fulfilled. I'm proud of myself. They can't say that. Dude, if I was to go now, God's honest truth, man. I wouldn't have no regrets right now. Mm. And I sincerely mean that, man. That's amazing, man. That's amazing. And that, you know, that approach to life, man, it, it's so refreshing. I mean, you're, you're at a completely different league when you can wake up during the darkness of the night and force yourself to get out of the toasty bed and pursue discomfort. And obviously after you come back from the gym, what happens then? When you, when you finish your workout and you shower... Because when do you usually start work? Nine? No, I'm I'm in at least forty minutes early, bro. Okay, so you're you're in work forty minutes early, but from from waking up and completing your workout, there's a gap of a few hours as well. What do you do in those hours? Yeah, then I get to work. Simply, I have my breakfast. I do my reading. 
And do you feel like the focus in that time of the day is different? Oh, 100%, man. Because no one's awake, Dude, no one's belling your phone. The way I look at it is, right, in order for me to be of service, I need to serve myself first. Ooh, that's powerful. In order for me to be selfless, I need to be selfish. And the only time I can be selfish is uncomfortable times when no one's awake, when it's just me and my maker. I'll have a conversation with God, that God, I'm grateful for this another day. So I want to give my best to your people. I want to serve. I want to be of service. So let me serve. How do I serve? By giving, by showing gratitude, by getting my ass to the gym. And you feel like your dedication to your fitness has seeped into other areas of your life. A million percent, dude. So I, for I, someone who's currently unfit watching this video, where would you tell them to begin? Now. Stop the lies and just admit that you need help. Just accept it. You're not fluffy. You're not big boned. If you can't see the piece... <laughs> We got some work, baby. Yeah. We got some work. That That's all I'm going to say. Yeah. But you have to begin there. You can't lie to yourself, man. Lying to yourself. What is he doing? What is he doing to you right now? Only you can answer. You have to be that person that delivers the truth. Look yourself in the mirror right now. Look yourself right in the mirror and say... If you're happy with the person that looks back at you in the mirror, cool, happy days, you're winning. Congratulations, salute you, sir. But if you're that person who's not happy with the person that's looking back in the mirror, then say, I need help. You know, uh, Jim Rowan says, the day that turns your life around is the day you experience disgust. When you say enough, is enough dude oh, man people are afraid to feel desperate people are afraid to feel disgusted but these are some of the best emotions that you could ever harness in order to get you to the place where you need to be dude i'm still nowhere near where i want to be i'm still nowhere near but i know enough how to Get somebody started. Mm -hmm. I know enough that all you gotta fucking do is put one fucking foot in front of the other. No matter how hard it gets, you show up. And if it's 30% that you can give, you give, you lay out there and you put out 30%, that's 100%. You, if you're only capable of giving a 30% workout, but you did everything in that 30%, you put out a 100% mm. and you won. You won. Your next battle is going to be what you put in your mouth. You don't even look at what you're going to have for dinner. You think, oh, I'm going to make you do breakfast. I'm going to have my macros. I'm going to have my eggs, whatever you got to have, man. You got to do. Then you leave that. That's another win. Mm -hmm. That's it. And you keep stacking those wins until you look back five years later and you're like, wow, man, I can't recognize who I was back Dude, then. Dude, it came to a stage where God had blessed me with enough resources that I can buy. I could have bought all the clothes I wanted. But you know what I couldn't fucking do? Fit into any of them. Mm. You know what that does to a man? It's the most disgusted feeling that you'll ever experience. But I was the guy I would tr try avoiding any public events, any weddings, bro, because I knew fucking A, I looked like shit. Secondly, I was limited to what I could wear. 
And to all the people that are watching who are overweight, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You know exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah. You got to do something about that. You got to do something about that. But brother, that. but brother, how many people? It's like, you know, in the gym, right? Whenever I see somebody who's overweight, but they come, bro, I make it my mission to go up there and say, brother, thank you for inspiring me. Because you want to get reminded how hard it is at the start. Mm. And for all of you guys, you know when you see a large person in the gym and you fucking snigger at it more, you give them funny looks, you should be ashamed of yourself. Because that Absolutely. person there is the strongest person there, man. Look after them. Don't feel sorry for them. Just go up to them, man. I got you, whatever you need. Exactly, because there's so many things that they're overcoming just to be there, you know? Dude, I, I understood this, right? I never experienced it in my life, but I experienced that. I was so ashamed of myself getting to the gym. You know, bro, when you're 365 pounds, it's fucking hard, bro, just getting to the gym. Your belly's hanging, you're worried about what people think. Because a lot of people are just physically fit, they're blessed, they put in the hard work, they look like fucking models, and you're there, you're fucking chunky as fuck, you you can't lift the weights, or you haven't got proper technique, etc. But you're showing up, and you become self-conscious, because but there's nothing to be self-conscious about. There's nothing to fear. The gym is the most beautiful place you'll ever be. It's a lot of dysfunction in one place. Everyone's battling the same thing. Everyone has their own demon that they're trying to overcome, right? Someone, someone there is overcoming a breakup. Someone is overcoming. Oh, dude, bro, you know? do you hear so many people talk about the breakups in the gym? Mm. And that's the and you know why, ABH fitness is a a gateway to your true self because that's the if you if you and I wish most people hit rock bottom bro I wish that that pain that disgust they need to experience it changes why, you it changes you man and it, it should change you mm. and why fitness is important because that's one of the only things that you can truly control you can control mm. who, what you put in your mouth, who you hang out with. Yeah, and it says a lot about you. If you're somebody who's out of shape, I mean, it shows to the world, that, as harsh as this may sound, that you are neglecting yourself. A million, a million percent? Yeah, you know? and uh, people will make an assumption, as much as that may be unfair, they will look up and down and think, okay, this person is probably lazy. But obviously, if they're in a gym, that's something not to to look, look down on. I mean, they're there to change their life and to better themselves. But people do judge. And it's up to you to make sure that the judgment they make is as positive as possible. You can't control everybody's assumption of you. Dude, you know the beauty, beautiful thing is? When people are actually working hard in the gym and they know you are physically trying your best, they will support you. Oh, absolutely. They will support you. 100%. They will support you, brother. This is what I'm saying, man. Don't be afraid of something that you don't know. There's so much help out there. You just got to be intelligent enough to seek out the right people. And don't absolutely. be one of those people who's like, oh, I'm going to do carnival. I'm going to do keto. And... When you've literally eaten shit for the for the last God knows, God knows how many years to make such a radical change is disaster. I'm with you fully, man. With you fully. Hassan, I'd love you to share three of the most impactful books that you've read to wrap up this podcast. Because I know you're an avid reader. You're somebody who 
loves to acquire knowledge, what are the three books that have impacted you the most? Number one, Mindset by Carol Dweck. If you haven't read that book, you need to read that. That will undo so much of what you've been conditioned, what's affected you throughout the life, or why you why you do certain things. Mindset by Carol Dweck, number one. The other book I would say, it's 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 a it's a very funny book. It's never split the difference. Mm. Chris Wass. Great book. Yeah. Fact is it right there? No, it's on on my desk. Okay. And the third book. Dude, I've got like now you put me on the spot. They don't have to be, you know, in any particular order, but three books that have really impacted you. Like, give me a couple of seconds to me think about this one. The other book I would say. That book that you recommended to me. That you that you showed me, that you were highlighting. Oh, um, which and one about that? becoming like a magnetic individual and sharing value? I think what's the title of the book called again? You sent me the the name of the book. Oh, key person of influence. That's a great book. Yeah, that, that's a Daniel Priestley, great book. One other book I would say you need to read. Nick Saban's book. Dude, that, that's phenomenal. What's the book called? The co- uh, sorry, A Trillion Dollar Coach. That's a not Nick Saban. A Trillion Dollar Coach. Yeah. Okay. A trillion Dollar Coach. Sounds um, like my kind of book. Yeah, dude. It's a phenomenal book. Phenomenal book. That's amazing. Well, I, I want every single person to... And one last, one last book, actually. Extreme Ownership by Jocko Willink. Extreme ownership. Extreme ownership. Mm. Jocko Willink, phenomenal book. That that book will change your life. Because you know what? It will completely put the magnifying glass on you. It'll make you look at yourself and what you're doing. Because, dude, you can't hide then. If you're taking extreme <clears throat> ownership, if you are, if something goes wrong in your life and you say... Yeah, that was my fault. Even when people say, no, 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 it's not your fault. Dude, you come across as such a great leader when you take accountability and people respect you more. You start respecting yourself more. Mm-hmm. Different, man. That book is totally transformative. I love that. I love but that. there's so many books, man. There's you- so many. There's so many, and, and I'm a voracious reader, by the way. Yeah, and I, I want you guys to pay attention to the content that Hassan's making, because he drops in some nuggets in there and some of the books that he's read. And I'm, I'm going to link all of Hassan's socials down in the description below. I want Dude, you guys I to sometimes give him a I think I go a bit too hard. Uh, like, you know what? That's what people need to need to hear, man. They need to hear it. The Daily HS, dude. I, coach the, HS. That's what we call him. And uh, yeah, you guys call me the coach or the notorious Big H. That's know? it. But, you know, to, to wrap up in 60 seconds, someone who wants to better their life, we're almost four months into the year now, right? What would you tell them? What are the first three steps or even in just one in one line, what can they do to have their best year yet? Accept where you are. Meet yourself where you are. Forgive yourself for what's ever happened, what's, whatever's happened, and then decide that you want to change. And that change does not have, does, doesn't need to be drastic. It does not need to be drastic. It begins with the tiny steps. 20 minute walk, but it starts with fitness and your mind. Before you even do anything, it's the mind. It's the six inches between your ears that needs working out. If we can control your thoughts and bring emotional control and that temperance in you, 
you're unstoppable. But like Ali said, he's going to link all my bio. Yes. What's your Instagram handle? The Daily HS. The Daily HS. No underscores, nothing. See, I'm so new and this I'm glad this is happening in real time that I actually need to know well, my... I'll link the right one in anyways. But, so, uh, yeah. So, it's... One minute. The P-H-E H-S underscore daily. Nice. Okay. Oh, that's, uh, that's, is that Instagram? That's Instagram. And TikTok. And TikTok. Dude, your listeners are going to think, why did you bring this guy on? Uh, he doesn't even know his own stuff. Well, you know what? You're too busy doing the work. <laughs> That's what it is. And TikTok is the Daily HS. No underscore. P-H-E-D-A-I-L-Y-H-S. Well, there you have it. There you have it, ladies and gents. You've got the social media handles. Hassan, this has been an incredible podcast. You know, so many valuable nuggets were shared. And uh, I'm sure we will definitely do another one very soon as well as things progress for the both of us. But thank you for gracing the studio with your presence today. Brother, pleasure is all mine. I want to just say thank you very much for letting me into this world. And thank you for exposing me, the law of exposure. Once exposed, you cannot be unexposed. And thank you for showing me what hard work is and truly, truly living your values. I appreciate it, brother. It's an honor to be your friend and to be mentored by yourself. The honor goes both ways, brother. So it's a privilege to, to be a friend of yours and a brother. And, uh, man, I can't wait to share some incredible memories together, man, and celebrate more splendacious W's oh. in rooftop lounges across the world. That's, it, That's the goal, brother. Yes, sir. Yes, but sir. Appreciate, appreciate you for coming brother, down, bro. Thank you very much for, having, for having me. Thanks for having me. And, and we'll repeat this again very, very yes, soon. Yes, 